Hello, ladies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try that again. So this is a hastily rescheduled. Whether you guys got the same as me, which is absolutely last minute. Uh, rescheduling. Um, this is uh, chapters ten and eleven. in the book so we're going to spend i think more time looking at the using language uh chapter because this is possibly the most challenging and uh we'll have a look at delivering the speech just for the last um, 10 or 15 minutes because that is um, you can probably tell that it's a fairly short chapter so uh, when we when we're speaking or when we're communicating really the big difference between um intermediate level and advanced level English is basically not really much in terms of grammar, but it is in uh, terms of um, the exactness and preciseness in the way that you communicate. So um, you'll find that uh, if anybody goes on to a more advanced level, then um, you will find that it was it is just a lot of vocabulary learning. Basically, there's very little um in the in terms of grammar so once you've actually mastered all the grammar forms and um, there's not that many really so once you've actually mastered all of those then um, it is just really a case of um, rapidly and massively expanding your vocabulary um accurate words are important and um, accurate words are just as important as accurate numbers um, no one can really get what you mean. Um, we need to be aware of this, and word choice is very, very important. The difference between words can can really be just one syllable. I think that most uh, most Chinese language learners have made the uh, mistake of uh, saying that uh, they enjoyed some tasty snakes instead of saying uh, enjoying some tasty snacks. Um, so you need to be aware that the mispronunciation of just one syllable. Um, I don't know uh, if people have ever made the mistake of asking for a kitchen sandwich when they mean a chicken sandwich. Just swapping around the uh, some of the some of the uh, the syllables in a in a word can be um, can be uh, either fatal or amusing, and we want to avoid really both forms when we're seriously communicating. So. I remember the story of uh, of a guy who who got uh, a Japanese word wrong and ended up embarrassing him and his uh, his host uh, family in Japan. I probably may tell that story later on. We also need to be aware that the uh, way that we write English, the mode of communication there, is distinctly separate to spoken English. So uh, we can't really deliver written English uh, spoken. We, can, we can't really say this thing, okay? So we can't really just uh, write out an essay and just recite it. We need to actually understand the modes of communication and how they are different. We need to focus on everyday simple language. This does not mean um, childish language, it does not mean um, that it will be less mature, but the way of um, uh, communicating ideas simply, it's essentially what makes uh, the difference between a, a bad and a good communicator, is that we're actually able to um, choose words and make things clear and make people understand. Um, if you're a very, very good communicator, oftentimes the the audience or the listener will have no choice but to understand so um we need to avoid certain special groups of words so we need to avoid jargon telegraphic sentences and slang jargon these are the words which are specific to a certain profession or group and what you'll find is that a lot of people outside of those specific professional groups and academic groups, um, people will not really understand uh, what those words 
mean or what those phrases mean so if you're ever unlucky enough to be able to uh, hear police officers or lawyers talking to each other police officers especially or airline pilots they actually have their own um, they actually have their own kind of vocabulary and their own uh, shorthand way of communicating um, you have to have um, you have to learn some pretty thick books of specialist words and specialist um, expressions to be able to work as something as technical as a police officer or something as technical as a um, as, as a lawyer or an airline pilot or an engineer so the language is always already quite specific because of the profession and then in the workplace the language becomes even more specific and specialized so we can't use this language um, if it comes up in our research, we can't use this language uh, when it's uh, when we see it. We have to be able to understand it, and we have to be able to um, we have to be able to uh, explain it to other people. Telegraphic sentences are words which you'll often. The best way to, to listen to these kinds of uh, telegraphic sentences, the best way to get examples here, is that. Uh, you go and just listen to what the waiters are saying in a restaurant and they will often um, speak in a, in a shorthand they will not speak in uh, long sentences because long sentences um, there's a lot of noise and it's a high pressure environment there's a lot of time sensitive information that needs to be given so we need to um, speak in telegraphic sentences this comes from the idea that when you send a telegram each word costs money so you need to uh, use as few words as possible in order to save money. Um, you will often hear people saying two teas, please, um, or two beers for table seven. You will speak, uh, they won't actually say two glasses of beer for the people at table seven. They'll just say two beers, table seven. And then that will, uh, that will um, uh, be enough to actually communicate in that environment. So telegraphic sentences are often sentences with just the key verbs or the key nouns in there with no prepositions or no um, or no uh, kind of um, please or thank you. They just they just pass on the information. And slang, we have this. Uh, these are highly informal ways of talking with close friends. Um, you'll often hear people in highly um, in highly um, informal situations, for example, people are talking in a bar or something like that, where um, they will actually, just try and get my uh, annotation thing working here. So they will actually say things like, I can't get my text to work, I'm gonna start this thing again. Text. Yep. We'll try this. Okay, so we will actually say, uh, someone's talking about my wife. Uh, they may say in, uh, in slang, this would just be the missus. Um, so this is a very formal, you would never say this in any formal, uh, if you said it in a formal situation, it would be a big joke. It would be you know, something to do with comedy. But uh, my wife is the missus. Or uh, I don't know what uh, it's something even more um, offensive for husband. Um, my old car. You would say my old banger. So um, banger is a slang term for an old car. So we have all these. You probably have the same things in Chinese. We avoid these uh, three major groups. That's one of one main main thing that we've got here. So jargon, telegraphic sentences, and slang we need to avoid in our communication. When we communicate in English, we do expect a slightly deeper level of detail than you're probably used to, and not only from your English language classes, but also from, uh, from uh, the media in general. I'll just, uh, th there are two factors. There's, there's the educational idea that you've been taught to express yourself in a certain way or there's environmental factors as well 
So culturally and environmentally, Chinese communication, uh, frustratingly for a lot of um, for a lot of foreigners, uh, tends to either lean towards vague language or no language at all. But it's um, it's often better to say nothing to avoid people uh, losing face. And this is not really something that we we would encourage. Um, you, you'll often find that native English speakers will give. Um, Instead of if they don't know the answer, they will give information that people already know, um, which is obviously it's just kind of like a little um, cultural and language uh, habit that people have got. Um, saying the improper thing is not considered to be harmful in English. So if people are complaining and if people are pointing out uncomfortable, true things, uh, this is often a sign, as I said, of a healthy society and uh, a society where everybody is free to. Um, is free to uh, express themselves and, and hopefully uh, improve in the future. In Chinese, it would be, uh, it's not really acceptable to whether ever directly refuse someone by saying no, but uh, we may find that people are, are reaching for uh, vague phrases like, it's not convenient, which obviously is a bit, uh, Complete matter of uh, matter of opinion, whether something's convenient or not. So, if you're a rich businessman and you walk into a bank and someone someone tells you it's not convenient right now, it can be uh, you know people can get understandably a little bit upset about that. Uh, oftentimes, when I'm uh, trying to get some things done in China, then uh, we often get um, uh, it can't be done. People will say it cannot be done, when really what they mean is I don't know how to do it. So. There's a, there's a kind of a, a distinct cultural appreciation, especially in public, that uh, uh, non-Chinese uh, speakers need to be aware of. Pretending to be ignorant, pretending to be unclear or uninformed, um, expressing yourself in vague, moderate terms. You'll find in English that this function is more of a social impediment rather than a social virtue. In uh, English, we, we tend to um, expect uh, we don't expect vague language from people. For example, if you are doing your job, we don't expect vague language from this. From a professional, we expect um, clear and concise, exact, precise, exact language. We don't, uh, we don't express ourselves in moderation uh, in English. Uh, this is not just specific for people going from uh, Chinese to English, um, going from English to a language like German. Um, Germans are very direct about things. Uh, Germans uh, seem to think that uh, criticism is beneficial, and um, they don't make a, they don't make uh, they don't uh, think that the the thing that you produce and the person who produced it they see Germans see these things as two distinct separate things. So when they criticize the the work that you do, they're not really criticizing you. Um, it's, it's a really weird concept in German to, uh, to get around, but constructive criticism is always quite helpful. So we can see a clear circular problem that in order to get a higher credit for language use, you need to actually demonstrate this higher level of language use. Unfortunately, um, cultural and environmental factors often mean that um, it's not acceptable to be ex uh, precise and exact in your language. So it's one of those little um, language uh, points where it becomes a little bit more cultural than um, something that you can learn in a textbook. You simply can't speak in the Chinese mode of communication when you're speaking in English. So just an example of the level of detail that we see in uh, uh, this, this is by no means scientific, um, I, I should say. It's just something that I did. So we have this China Daily Report. Um, on the 5th of September, there was an earthquake in uh, Chengdu. And what we find on the China Daily website is that we find that we have about 190 words and six photographs. And the 190 words are um, pretty, pretty basic, straightforward information. It's, um, it reads more like... A, a, a scientific report than a news report, really. So there's single sentences, and we just see lots of numbers, and people give the bare facts and have to make their own, have to make their own ideas. There's no uh, very little analysis and very little um, and very little uh, insight here. You have to really um, 
fill in the gaps. We would, um, I mean, there is nothing really in this news report that you couldn't already find out, um, especially, you know, if you on uh, keeping a track of earthquakes, which uh, in, uh, in Asia you should be really, because uh, they're quite dangerous. So we have 190 words and six photographs. The shortest that I could find, um, I think the shortest one that I could find was 375 words, but the same story in a UK newspaper uh, came up to about 490 words uh, with one picture. So there was a lot more analysis, there was a lot more detail. The words obviously are not, uh, the number of words is no indicator of the quality of the writing, but there is an expectation that there's going to be more detail in, uh, in, in, in the English language. So, um, the Times had uh, 375 words, that was the shortest, the shortest I could find in English. And the China Daily had 190 words which was uh, the shortest that I could find. So even the two shortest reports, the English language version was almost twice as long. Um, Time magazine went out to 722 words, um, but there were around 500 words, maybe even 600 words that we got. So we see denser use of language in the word counts. We may not see too much variability in the quality probably. Um, fairly straightforward because it is always you know, basic journalism, but we do see a lot more detail and we do see a lot more information in the uh, English language reports than we do with the, um, uh, with the Chinese uh, reports. There's probably some longer uh, coverage out there uh, since then, but I was trying to get the same day. So we can see there's a lot more detail in English than we would expect from, uh, you know, if you were in an environment where there's all of this um, reduced straightforward information, then the, the tendency is that you will try to imitate that type of, uh, that type of style. So uh, just be aware that we do expect a little bit more detail in English. We need to um, address concerns and questions that the audience might have. When it comes to jargon, um, a lot of our research that you see is written in the jargon of a particular field. So um, academic research is often written for other academics. Um, and we're often dealing with um, theoretical ideas, difficult scientific concepts like quantum computing. Um, we have a lot of unfamiliar words and we have a lot of unfamiliar concepts. So we need to take a special care here when we need, when we are looking at explaining some of these. Some, someone actually did this as an informative speech uh, last year, where, there's going to, where there is, um, where there is um, a real kind of, uh, there's a lot of technical information, even at a basic level to understand quantum computing. So it wasn't really a good choice, but the guy tried his best. So when we have unfamiliar words, we need to make sure that we understand what those mean. And we also need to understand their place in describing the unfamiliar concepts. Very, very few uh, regular people in the street are going to be aware. They've probably heard of quantum computing, but they're not. Could they fix a quantum computer? Probably not. We also need to be careful not to communicate in what is essentially the opposite of jargon, which is, as I said, slang, which is just a highly familiar way that friends and family often talk. And uh, you have to have known someone for years to be able to do this. And we need to avoid telegraphic sentences. Um, we need to talk in complete sentences and make sure that we um, clearly get all the information that is needed there. We do all of this explanation and we do all of this um, communication by using synonyms and synonyms in English, probably in the same way that uh, synonyms exist in Chinese. Um, but most of us come from the French. Uh, in 1066, we were invaded by a French king and um, English peasants know there's, there's pretty one safe rule in life. And that is that if you want to live longer, you should learn the language of the king. You're more likely to be more useful and less likely to uh, have your head chopped off. For a long time, up to the maybe even the 19th century, 
Um, French used to be the international language of communication. If you were um, lucky enough to have a, a good education back then, you would have been taught both English and French, and you would be expected to go and uh, get a government job working overseas somewhere. So we didn't learn there. Uh, you would probably think it would be better for, for, the, for the British in that period of time to go and learn um, Hindi or something like that. But no, we, we went and we spoke French. So because of this uh, strong 300, maybe 400 years of French influence on the language, we got the idea that educated people in the upper classes of society uh, would speak French. So um, the rich lady, lady of the house, who was a well-educated woman with lots of money, she would perspire and she would expectorate, she wouldn't say like the kitchen staff who were uneducated and uh, did menial servant jobs, they would live, uh, if anybody's seen um, films and TV shows about the way that people live, they would uh, live pretty much in the basement of the house and they would sweat and spit. So um, the, uh, the stronger Anglo-Saxon Germanic words would be used by the uneducated. Uh, groups in society and um, even if they weren't educated the upper classes would use the french words it's very easy to spot uh, the french or the latinate language um, words that end in t-i-o-n are french so information perspiration situation french is well english is just french with bad pronunciation so we would just say information perspiration situation that's all you would say, and then the uh, to English ears, that sounded like information and situation. Words that end in C-A-L are also French. Um, the word is uh, economical or political from the economique or politique. Words that end in E-N-T are often French. Moment, comment, embarrassment, encouragement, moment, comment, embarrassment, encouragement. All of these French words are French. Words that end in A-B-L-E are often French. Table is table. Comfortable is comfortable. And acceptable is acceptable. So we see um, a lot of these um, French words, a lot of French nouns, abstract nouns like um, economical ideas, comfortable ideas about comfort. Um, and uh, French is rich in those uh, particular adjectives. And we use those um, oftentimes. The, um, we'll have things, there was a style in uh, about uh, 500 years ago when English literature first began to take shape. There was a style where we would put the French and the English together. So we had both, the, um, so for example, you would see um, liberty and freedom put together. The liberty and freedom may mean this, may both mean freedom, but it was just um, because the French sounded better and we needed to tell people what the French meant. It just became a writing habit that people would put these words together. So um, oftentimes you may, you may see these. Uh, you'll definitely see them used in everyday language. Um, not all of the words are high level. Not all of the words can be classed as jargon. But if you see a lot of these big words in a single sentence or a paragraph, then uh, you can expect that um, uh, you, know, you have to be a little bit cautious and you have to go slowly and really think about what is being communicated in that paragraph or that sentence. The best way to get um, an idea of what familiar language is as opposed to a higher level language like jargon or a lower register language like slang is that you communicate with native speakers. If you don't like doing that, the, the second best way is to start reading as widely as you can. So we need to resist the urge to make ourselves sound important by using complex big words. I'm sure that some of you, have, a lot of your professors are guilty of this. Um, professors are not really, lecturing is not really an ideal way of learning because uh, the lecturer just stands at the front of the classroom and uh, listens, listens to themselves speak. Uh, 
and they uh, basically your professors will stand at the front of the class and uh, teach themselves and listen to how uh, impressive they sound rather than actually making the language and the ideas accessible uh, to the people who really need to know this information. The professor already knows this information, but they like the sound of their own voice. So don't use complex big words. Um, nothing is so complex, it cannot be made simple. So um, the, the public speaking course is not really a test of vocabulary um, as such. You do need to choose the right words. There is such a thing as um, appropriate word choice, but oftentimes they are um, the simplest words and not the most complex. Um, uh, we need to uh, reward straightforward communication over sounding professional. Um, the course instructors are pretty well read and pretty confident and pretty comfortable reading possibly longer excuse me longer in-depth pieces than you're uh, than you're used to and um, for example we have this article um, just an example from a magazine called the economist um, this is a weekly newspaper a weekly news newspaper and on average it contains um, around sixty-seven thousand words each week um, spread over a hundred uh, pages the language is considered to be at graduate level graduate reading ability so um uh, you can you know the the um the professors and the uh, the lecturers the native english speakers you know it's it's difficult to really grasp what native level is this is what it is it can be difficult really to understand that people actually read something like this for pleasure and for entertainment so just be aware of, you know, we're not, we're not playing at speaking English. Importantly, we need to make the distinction between complex and complicated. Uh, complex language does not mean complicated language. So for example, we can have um, complex language that uses clear clauses and subordinates. So we can have two sentences, Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare was born in Stratford. Um, we can create from those two simple sentences, we create a complex sentence. Shakespeare, who wrote Romeo and Juliet, was born in Stratford. So this is not a complicated sentence, but in terms of English language, in terms of language, not just English language, we would actually say that um, this is a complex sentence. So complex does not mean complicated. Complicated would when, when we're using a lot of um, obscure words that we need to check in the dictionary before we understand. So don't make the uh, mistake that uh, complex means complicated. We don't mean that. We mean that you need to have to use complex sentences in order to sound more mature, but that does not mean that you use language that nobody can understand. Unfortunately, for um, a, lo a lot of Chinese students, I find that um, longer sentences with lots of relative clauses and lots of relative pronouns will actually um, cause students to just get lost. Um, this is really this is an extreme example. Um, the book, which it was not something I would normally consider reading, was kindly lent to me by her. And it was one that she had recommended that I read because her sister's friend had been told by his teacher. It would be good for improving his vocabulary when the time came for him to take his exams, which were causing him a great deal of worry. So when we have um, when we have a lot of relative clauses, when we have a lot of pronouns, um, it's very very easy. I, I find that um, Chinese students find these these kind of sentences quite challenging, um, especially with it as well. So it 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 would be, um, it was, it would be. So with all of these um, relative pronouns that we use then we um, we tend to see that people get confused quite easily um, mostly because this is not the way that you would communicate uh, in in chinese which is you know very contextual based so these relative pronouns like it that which who whom and some of the phrases that are created from them by that by which of whom from whom with whom and uh, these are actually unfortunately all necessary to learn they're one of the more challenging uh, aspects of, um, of English. And if there's any German students as well, in, um, there are words um, that are just the same in German, which take a long time to understand um, how they are used. So 
um, uh, phrases like darby, um, which which are compounds of um, thereby. So when you have phrases like this, unfortunately they are used quite a lot, but um, but um, they are also um, a little bit trickier to understand. But they are key to be able to form complex sentences in your writing and your speaking. When we're doing this, again, I've got extreme examples here, which are just examples of really how not to do stuff. We need to avoid long distance relationships. And um, there are lots of um, sentence patterns in English. Um, for example, when we say either, oops, I'll get the right one here. So when we say either, we expect an or. When we say neither, we expect nor. When we say as, we expect another as, okay? We can't have, between these uh, words, we can't have a lot of words or a lot of ideas. This needs to be quite short. So uh, in spoken English, you either decide to come with us or not. This would be absolutely completely acceptable. Try and choose another color. Here we go. So you either, and then I have to, where's it gone? It's there. Or, so you either decide to accompany us on this trip, which I'm told will be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Because of the effects of sea erosion on the land, and we probably won't be able to see this type of thing ever, ever again in our lifetimes, or not. There's too much information in between um, these two grammatical elements of the sentence. So we can't actually add that much, that much in between. The first sentence is easier, the first sentence, sentence is more natural. And the relationship between the either and the not is not separated by a lot of, you know, a, a big long list of ideas that we need to memorize. So we need to avoid putting um, a strain on the reader's or the listener's short term memory by keeping, uh, being concise in our communication and being aware of these, the importance of these grammatical elements. So we need to see those elements, those relationships, and we need to make sure that those elements are as immediate as possible. So it might look, this is one of the big dangers of writing out your speech and then memorizing the speech is that on the page, it's possible to actually go backwards and forwards to confirm these long distance relationships. So you can have slightly longer distance relationships um, in written language. In spoken language, you can't do that because you can't go backwards and forwards. So um, you need to be aware that if something makes sense on the page, it doesn't mean it will necessarily make sense in a spoken form. The second thing that we need to look at here is the second or third thing, a second thing. So we need to look at using concrete words in our language. We try to avoid making um, the language poetic. We try to avoid um, uh, using a lot of metaphor. I think that English uses fewer metaphor um, than Chinese does. For example, it's, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to say that in Chinese, in my heart I feel. So it's, it's quite acceptable for you to use these metaphors. In, in English, we don't really do that. Um, we separate the, 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 the emotions are in the mind and uh, we separate those things out and we try not to be too flowery in our communication. So trying to get some of the poetry from the Mandarin way, the Chinese Mandarin way of writing. It, it almost, it's virtually impossible to do this. I've seen some ancient Chinese poems um, translated into English and they don't really sound like poems to me at all. So it will always almost sound awkward. You can go and see some English translations of uh, some of the uh, Song Dynasty poets to see how, how clunky it gets. So we try to use precise terms and we try to avoid ambiguous terms. Again, this is another temptation of, um, you know, being poetic um, in that we, um, 
you might believe that an ambiguous term or a vague term would add depth or enrich your communication. And in English, it doesn't because the um, the informative speech and the persuasive speech, you can possibly be a little bit more poetic in the persuasive speech, but especially in the informative speech, um, we don't really expect that much um, that much poetry. Um, you would not expect an English class to be in the form of a poem, for example. So try to avoid the temptation of adding literary um, um, merit to your uh, to your speeches. It doesn't really work that well. We should always choose preciseness over generality. So instead of ball games, we should talk about basketball. Instead of uh, what's the best way to improve my English, we should be asking more specific questions like how do I improve my listening skills? So you're asking a more specific question here. You've identified that something's um, uh, specifically wrong. So um, the same thing is in, in the same with um, asking for help with written work. Um, uh, you know, you, you need to tell people what you think are the shortcomings and the failures the specific failures in a piece of work before we get feedback. You can't just ask a native speaker to please polish this, please polish my English. You can't just do that. So you need to be much more specific about what the problem is rather than just giving an essay to a, to a teacher and say, please correct this. Uh, th there may be some, you know, a whole load of corrections in terms of structure language and grammar, and the whole thing may need to be rewritten. So be specific when you're asking for help. Ambiguity we'll find uh, most commonly used in comedy, most commonly, commonly used in jokes. One morning I shot an, uh, one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I will never know. I didn't say that these would be particularly hilarious jokes. Woman without her man is nothing. Those are the kind of things that you would see on, on greeting cards or tea towels. Some people think this is funny. Um, it's just an example. So the ambiguity um, is often used in a humorous way and often ends, end, ends up being used that way as well. Even from native English speakers, we see failures in communication. So we, we can have... Um, on tonight's program, Conan will discuss sex with Dr. Ruth. So it's not really clear from this, uh, from this sentence whether Conan is going to be discussing sex and Dr. Ruth is going to be a participant in that discussion or whether Conan is just going to be telling us about the last time he had sex with Dr. Ruth. Um, student cooks and serves grandparents. And there should be an S missing there so students cook and serve grandparents should be students cook for their grandparents doctor no heart cognitive issues uh, this was a a newspaper headline trying to reassure us that donald trump did not have any heart issues and did not have any brain issues but it just came out as him having no emotions and being a bit mad include your children when baking cookies does not mean you should use your children as an ingredient when you're baking cookies. It means that you should involve your children when you're baking cookies. These things taken from newspaper headlines, um, oftentimes they are written without thinking. Oftentimes there's no chance to actually um, correct what has gone out. And we end up with a whole big long list of um, epic fails, as they say in online. So a good start to becoming more precise in your language is to remove any sentence that contains the word some. Uh, because the choice of some is too vast for native speakers, remember that native speakers will have a, a much larger vocabulary than you will have. So you may know maybe two or three ball games or two or three exercises where native speakers know maybe 60 or 70. And it's too difficult, it's too vast, that choice is too vast for us to choose the exact exercise 
to fit to your particular context. So instead of saying doing some exercises helps people get fit, try to replace that with try lifting weights in the gym to improve your overall strength. This is actually um, a much more specific and better sounding, more mature way of communicating rather than just saying you should do more exercise, you should wear less clothes or something like that. You need to be more specific. What exact clothes would you suggest? So you need to help the listener with suggestions rather than um, letting the listener guess. The same things exist in Chinese and these are often, they're similar to visual illusions. So I don't know whether these make sense. These, these actually don't make sense in English. The, the meaning, the double meanings are lost all the way through. So the door shao, door shao, door shao, and oh, I can't even do it myself. Door shao and door shao. So that's a little bit, it doesn't make sense in the translation, but you need to really look and try to see both, both images in the, in the sentence that you're, that you're writing. You need to try and see both sentences that you've actually, both meanings that you've written. So a lot of these things, um, they're, they're like, like these um, kind of weird visual illusions where if you look at it from this, from left to right, uh, you will see a duck. But if you look from it to right to left, you will see a rabbit. Um, you need to really review and look at what you've written and see whether what you've written has, um, can be taken in any, um, in, uh, any uh, other way than its original meaning, this intended meaning. Um, some people will use irony in that way, um, but unintentional irony can, be, um, can have uh, unintentional circumstances. When we look at redundancy and clutter, we're looking at removing interference from our message. So interference is really, um, as we saw in the first class, we have anything uh, that removes the clarity from your message is interference. This can be um, students sleeping in class to uh, construction work outside. The one thing that you can do to really help um, clarity is to remove redundancy and clutter. Um, we, these are two types of wordiness that um, we, we try to avoid. It's often easier, it's often possible to say a lot of things, to say a lot of redundant things and say a lot of cluttering things. And you can speak a lot, but not actually say anything. So you can say a lot of words, but the actual message is completely lost. We need to have a look at, um, one of the, the main things is the use of adverbs and collocations, the way that they collocate. So we have seriously and study um, does not collocate in English. Seriously will only really collocate with words like seriously consider, seriously think about, take seriously, seriously expect, seriously damaged, seriously ill, injured or wounded, or seriously wrong. But um, we don't really say that someone will seriously study. Um, it doesn't co-locate in English. So that's one thing that you need um, to be aware of is that nouns and nouns go together, verbs and nouns go together, and nouns and adverbs go together as well. You can't just put any together. Um, there's, there's a specific pattern that needs to be uh, learned. In terms of uh, using a lot of time phrases, we can remove these because uh, English has quite uh, a number of tenses that we can choose from. Uh, and we can actually mix together the tenses as well. So we can take the present continuous tense and we can um, add that to the past tense to create the past continuous. So we use tenses in English to indicate time. So you can say, I am running, I was running to indicate time. You don't need to say recently I have been running. Um, when we use the tenses, we often don't need the time adverb. So recently there have been important changes to the train timetable. We can just simply say there have been important changes to the train timetable. Nowadays, people tend to use their phones more for work than any other electronic device. People have been relying on 
their mobile phones for what increasingly over the last 10 years so we have the uh, what is that that is the present perfect continuous uh, have been relying and have been uh, these perfect tenses um, illustrate time uh, in a much more um, logical way to native English speakers. Um, nowadays, it's pretty redundant because the first question that you'll get is, um, well, when did that start? When do, when do the nowadays start? How recent? So I just need to sit down a little bit more comfortable. So I'll try to use tenses instead of the time adverbs. That's what they're used for. And Obviously, these, these are a little bit tricky to, to grasp because there's, um, it's, it's unde undefined time in the past, but recently can just be replaced with um, recently and nowadays. Try to practice using those present perfect tenses. We can eliminate words such as actually, apparently, basically, definitely, essentially, generally, kind of, particularly, particular really sort of specific type of virtually we all of these words so instead of saying a ferrari is a type of car we can simply say a ferrari is a car which a ferrari is a car that um, again using these relative clauses there are lots of redundant pairs there are lots of uh, nouns in english that don't really need an extra adjective so basic fundamentals well fundamentals are basic um, end result well the result is at the end you don't get the result at the beginning of something a free gift um, you don't you don't you don't give people um, you don't pe give people a gift and then expect them to pay for it um, important essentials final outcome future plans past history a uh, sudden crisis, terrible tragedy, true facts, an unexpected surprise. There's no such thing as an expected surprise, really. Um, and lots of the verbs don't need an adverb in English because they already have the idea of um, how you're doing something. So you can take a word like run, and then you can have jog, sprint, dash, dart, bolt, hurtle, speed, streak. Uh, they can, uh, all of these words can actually change the way that we think of the verb to run. If you're having difficulty understanding uh, whether something collocates or not, try to think of the, try to think of the opposite. So in the same way in maths that you can multiply and then you can divide to check your answer, you can actually do the same thing in, in English. Um, is it possible to study unseriously? Is it, possibly to, is it possible to unresolutely support or inactively accomplish something? If it sounds like it doesn't exist, it inactively accomplishes. So then if, if the opposite doesn't, if the negative doesn't exist, then it's, it's likely that the positive doesn't exist as well. So you can just do a little bit of uh, concept checking on, your, uh, on your, own, uh, your own writing. When it comes to these rhetorical devices that are in the, uh, in the book, uh, we've already seen the tricolon and metaphor. So we've already seen um, uh, repeating things three times with a slight change. Um, metaphor, we um, create images in words. Um, Alexa and her partner sail around the dance floor. Often, in, um, if you do any reading in English, you'll find that there is very, very little description of abstract ideas or emotions. Um, in English, we tend to rely more on describing the physical senses, sight, smell, touch, and maybe even tastes um, will help you convey the emotion to the audience. So the key thing is to describe these physical things in so much detail that it actually feels like uh, the person is there with you. Um, if you read a lot of travel writing, this is a, a, very, good, uh, a very good way of getting um, an impression of how writers can put people in a situation and they can control um, the emotional responses of the reader by the adjective and language choices describing the physical things and not the emotional things. So don't try and say things can make me feel. Um, try to actually um, describe the physical senses so vividly that the audience gets a similar sense as well. Similes, we can use um, as and as. 
Busy as a bee, as strong as an ox, as proud as a peacock, as wise as an owl. There's lots of, um, th this is a slightly cultural thing. Uh, are bees busy in Chinese? I don't know. Uh, but we have the idea that oxen are, are, are strong and powerful. They, uh, they do a lot of um, heavy lifting around the farm, so we have strong as an ox. As proud as a peacock, um, peacock goes, goes around and uh, shows himself off and tries to get uh, as many females as possible. As wise as an owl, I don't know where this came from. I guess this idea is that uh, owls stay up late and uh, study, uh, I guess. Um, but we've got lots of um, animal um, conventions as well that may not be true in Chinese. So just be careful. Um, there's one example that I give to students is that um, um, So, for example, if someone gets caught in the rain and someone um, someone comes back soaking wet, you you wouldn't say in, in I, you wouldn't. I'll tell you what you say in Chinese, but in in English we say a drowned rat. You look like a drowned rat when you come back because the the, um, the if you ever see a, a wet mouse or a wet rat, then the, they they're quite kind of skinny animals really, and the the fur clings to them. Um, I think it's wet chicken. I think it is wet chicken um, in uh, in Chinese. So he went out and looked like a wet chicken when he came back. So um, again, we have this idea that the, the two animals are similar in that the the feathers and the fur make them look bigger, and when it um, and when it rains, they actually look much much smaller and much more you know uh, like, like they've really been through a, a, a terrible trauma. So wet chickens and dried rats. These are kind of fundamental differences in the way that we think about animals. Uh, we also get this idea that, um, I think it's on this next page, um, pigs especially um, are seen as lazy because they don't do much work around the, uh, they don't do much work around the farm. They can't, um, they can't pull anything or carry anything or lift anything. And all they do is um, eat and uh, roll around in the mud. So we see pigs as being greedy and lazy. So a lot of these similes rely on cultural and, and uh, linguistic understanding that is unique to the English language. Um, many of them are related to animals and it's probably a good idea just to memorize a couple of them. So if, um, like um, we use a similes uh, to make a comparison, fit like a glove, runs like the wind or runs like a deer, chatters like a monkey, moves like a snail, sits there like a bump on a log. <laughs> One of my American friends told me that one. Eats like a pig, swims like a fish. You can also say drinks like a fish as well. Um, to stand out like a sore thumb. If you've ever uh, banged your thumb or you've hit your thumb, then you get some idea of, uh, you know, it's uh, it's virtually impossible to avoid um, your uh, a sore thumb. Um, some, uh, you know, memorize some of them. It will add a little bit of color to your language. When it comes to the rhythm, you'll see we've got a, an extract from Churchill, one of Churchill's speeches here. So we have one of Churchill's speeches written as a, as a poem. So we have this, this idea that English is stress timed, where we put emphasis on certain words in a certain rhythm. So there's a, there's a definite rhythm to the English language. Um, the syllables of a word can be longer or shorter, and the pitch can go up and down. So, and that will not affect the meaning of the word. So you can have, you, you probably hear children, uh, if you ever visit America, mom, dad, you can change the, change the pitch going up and down, change the length of the syllable, but the meaning of the word of mom and dad stays the same. In Chinese and Cantonese, that's not possible to do that. It's not possible to change the pitch of a word and maintain the uh, and maintain the actual meaning. So when people uh, people who have limited exposure to Mandarin or even Cantonese find this have has a um, 
it, it sounds like a machine gun, basically, um, especially when people are angry or passionate about something. Um, that an, an angry Chinese person sounds 10 times angrier um, just because of the delivery um, of the, of the uh, syllable timed language and um, where each, each syllable has to be the same length. Um, the same way in Italian as well. If you ever um, listen, find a video on uh, Yoku of an angry Italian, um, <laughs> you find it's, it's pretty terrifying to listen to. Uh, even if he's proposing to his girlfriend, and um, it can sound like the scariest thing, sounds like he's going to go and kill six people. Um, so syllable time languages and stress time languages have different uh, have different ways of communicating, have different ways of expressing and fitting the words into sentences, um, especially when it comes to lyrics of songs, poems, and uh, keeping the rhythm of a speech. One other thing to mention is that uh, native English speakers do not speak fast. Um, we don't speak any faster than any other native speaker. Um, we've all got the same brains and the brains control the muscles at the same rate. So it's, this is, the mouth muscles can only go so fast and they're all the same design. What we do use, which uh, creates a problem for a lot of uh, people that are unfamiliar with this is we use these things called reduced forms and often it's the schwa sound it's the uh, it's the e sound so you can have a sentence like people go to the airport in order to catch a plane people go to the airport in order to catch a plane so we have t t so it's not it's it's not particularly fast but it's it's reduced people go to the uh, people go to the airport in order to catch a plane so the O sound in two will be reduced to T. What kind of music do you like? What, sorry, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even, it's difficult for me to do. What kind of music do you like? Would be reading. What kind of music do you like? So what kind of music do you like? What kind of music do you like? So it becomes a little bit more rhythmic. You can probably hear the rhythm. People go to the airport in order to catch a plane. People go to the airport in order to catch a plane. So there's da 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 da. What kind of music do you like? What kind of music? What kind of music do you like? What kind of music do you like? So there's definite rhythm, and we can fit some of the uh, vowel signs using schwa, using this uh sound in the bottom of the throat. There. Just to finish off this chapter, a couple of uh, explanations of the rhetorical devices. Parallelism, it sounds um, particularly difficult. It's not really di too difficult to understand. And um, it's basically when you mention three or more characteristics, it's usually three characteristics. We try to keep that tricolon idea. So um, I think one of the examples on page 144 is, um, I'm not sure of the actual quotation, but it's the vigilant, the active, and the brave. So what we need to do is to imagine three train tracks and we can imagine those three train tracks running parallel to each other. So um, I'll just give you an, an example of this. So we can have, so normally we might say that brave, as a vigilant is most important, active is a little bit important, and then the brave is the least important. It's probably the way that we would normally um, prioritize qualities. With parallelism, they're all as important as each other. So we have three adjectives, three, three qualities working in parallel with each other. So the vigilant and the active and the brave, these three types of qualities, these three types of people, the, the vigilant people, the active people, the brave people, they are all equally important. In the second example, I speak as a Republican, I speak as a woman, I speak as a United States Senator, I speak as an American. She's not saying that being a Republican is any less important because it's the first thing. She's not saying that being an American is least important, being an, a Republican is most important. But in language, the only way that we can actually highlight that all these three qualities are the same um, is to use um, parallelism. So um, all these three qualities, these three characteristics, they run in parallel 
and they're not in any order of priority. Repetition, we have to be careful with this. The repetition is not an exact repetition. There's often a slight variation in uh, the way that we um, the way that we repeat just to actually draw draw attention to often the, the final point that we're trying to make so repetition in this example from a speech from last year uh, where the speaker keeps repeating vocational education the lack of synonyms is quite tedious and tiresome to listen to so vocational education has gained a lot of recognition in the last few years Many employers understand the value of the workers undertaking vocational education. Vocational education is going to be the second most valued type of higher education in China by 2040. So I recommend that people consider vocational education when they are thinking about whether to go to university or vocational education. That this type of repetition is to be avoided um, where we keep repeat, where we really don't demonstrate a good grasp of vocabulary. We often repeat key ideas with a minor change. Um, consciously, we, we put this in to provoke a thought so, or a reaction. So if not now, when? If not us, who? If not together, how? So we have uh, this really, we've seen it in the tricolon where we have repetition. It's really a powerful and, and common device. But we have if not, if not, if not. And then a question which changes, but it, it doesn't change, you know, significantly. It's a very, very small change. And the sentence pattern is if not, and then the question, if not, and then the question, if not, and then the question. So the, the actual structure is repeated quite closely. The words can change a little bit. Repeating the same words over and over again can be very, 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 very tiresome to listen to. We must imagine greatly, dare greatly, and act greatly. So imagine, dare, and act greatly, greatly, greatly. So we draw attention to the important last element here. We can imagine, we can dare, but most importantly, uh, we must not forget to also act as well. So those three things must be together in the, in the recipe. Alliteration is... Uh, simply just choosing words that have this the same initial sound not this not necessarily the same first letter but the same sound so for example photograph um oh, i can never use this thing so for example a famous photograph it's it's two f sounds but the spelling is different um, you, it's, it's kind of a little bit confusing with um, the examples in the book because they're using C sounds, which is um, can either be a hard or a soft C. Um, let's see if I can think of an example. So, so for example, there's a, a band soft cell. So there's an S written and a C written, but the sound is the, the sound. The initial sound on both these words is. Um, um, uh, both the same, so it's an S, S, and S. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the same first letter. Remember that language is all about sounds. It's not about um, the written, the written form. Peace is essential for progress. So we have that P and P. Cooperation, compromise, and common cause. So we have the K, K, K. So we could have. Um, I can't think of a good word that begins with K. But if, if you had a hard K, uh, you, would, you would be able to put that in the second sentence as well. So it would, be, it would just be the repetition of the sound, not necessarily the same first letter. You need to be careful with alliteration because um, we use alliteration a lot in tongue twisters. So... Um, a big bug bit the little beetle, but the little beetle bit the big bug back. So if you use alliteration a lot in your, in, especially in a sentence, 
Um, it can actually turn into a tongue twister and everybody will start laughing at you. How much caramel can a canny cannonball cram in a camel? If a canny cannonball can cram caramel in a camel. So you have the, the same repetition, the same alliteration taken to an extreme. Uh, you need to be careful about this, that you don't overuse alliteration. It can be a, it can be a huge, it can be a, uh, have the unintended result of having people laugh at you. Finally, antithesis, um, contrasting two ideas, which make people think again. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The famous uh, uh, JFK, John Kennedy speech. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Keep your mouth closed and your eyes open. If you fail to prepare, then prepare to fail. So uh, antithesis is contrasting two ideas, often swapping around. It's kind of like a mirror image of, uh, of in, in language where you have hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Keep your mouth closed and your eyes open. So it means um, stop talking so much and start observing more. So we use this antithesis all the time to actually, you know, convey concisely um, neater, neater ideas in a, in a more accessible way. Appropriateness of language is also uh, important, as I said. Um, word choices are important, and there's such a thing as register. So these are all these ideas in the back of the chapter are related to tone and register. And register is essentially the formality of the language. So when someone says, hey guys, this is pretty low down on the uh, register of formality, it's pretty informal. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, fairly high up on the register of formality. So you need to be, um, obviously, <laughs> obviously you need to choose the right language for the right occasion. If you meet a member of the uh, a member of the royal family, you can't say, "Hey, man, what's up?" Uh, you have to actually, you know, think of how uh, formal your language is going to be. Again, you get this through reading. You get this through um, exposure to the English language. A feeling of, uh, you know, how, how, what is appropriate language. Think about the audience when you're thinking about language. Um, you can't use overly technical language when you're not 100% sure that your audience will understand. If you're giving a conference at a, at a uh, uh, say a medical conference or something like that, um, you're, you're, in a, you're giving a speech to another group of lawyers and you're a lawyer. Um, people will be able to understand that highly technical language. Um, if you're talking to non-experts, if you're talking to people that have just wandered in off the street, people won't be too impressed. They'll, they will wander in and then wander out again. So if they can't understand what you're saying, it's completely useless. Actually, people, we, we actually say, um, we, we, if it's completely incomprehensible, if the words are in English, but people don't know what the words mean, people often say that, that the speech is we say is delivered in a foreign language so uh, we say that this is all greek to me or something like that so um, if people can't understand it they think it's a foreign language and they just walk away remember that nothing is so complex that it can't be made simple you do need to work at this you can't just take stuff from wikipedia and then uh, present that language because that language is is intended for um, specialists in that particular field the language gets very technical very quickly um, trying to think about how people friendly your language is. Try to think about whether um, non experts, maybe think of a non expert in your family, um, maybe your parents that are different major to you, or uh, you're trying to explain something to your grandparents. Um, something that non experts and the everyday person can understand, the man in the street, basically. If you can't find a way to make the language simple, uh, it's a good indicator that you don't actually understand the idea yourself. When you're thinking about the topic, um, make sure that we, the, the key thing here really is um, we don't really need to add drama to something that isn't dramatic, or we don't need to add poetry to something that isn't poetic. With the informative speech, you don't really need to use a lot of um, poetic or dramatic language. Um, in the persuasive speech, you do. so. 
for example, if you're giving an informative speech about how to change a tar tire, a, a car tire, so you don't um, you don't really need to um, use a lot of poetry and metaphor. But when you're talking about, um, say, a, um, a famous statesman or a, a, you know a famous politician or a, a, a great businessman or something like that, then a famous person, um, someone who's uh, just die for example you may be using a lot of metaphor and a lot of language devices um, for that um, it would be it would seem a little bit um, unemotional to talk in you know to talk about uh, a famous person that you admire in in very uh, unemotional language so think about how you how you reflect that and finally, you need to think about how comfortable you are using the language. So don't use words that you don't know how to pronounce. Don't copy the style of other people. And uh, do try to be more aware of the language. Um, it will be a struggle at the beginning, like a lot of things, but, um, but uh, eventually your own style, your own way of, uh, of, of, of doing things will, um, will come out. Um, it's only through doing these classes that I actually um, Kind of came to value people speaking simply and straightforwardly, rather than rather than uh, using a lot of metaphors and flowery language and language that I didn't understand. So it takes time to get to that level, so but it it does happen. Be careful when you're talking about people. Obviously, um, there are certain words that come in and out of use. There are certain words that are. Uh, viewed as being more offensive today than they were 40 years ago. Um, he or she, you don't really need to constantly use he or she. Try replacing it with changing the sentence pattern to there or changing the sentence pattern to they. So surgeons know how to do their job well. We can pluralize. Our students are complex learners and demanding. We must try to understand how they have different needs in the classroom. We can uh, say they. Try to avoid using words, emotion, you know, uh, pejorative words like cripple, mentally handicapped. Um, they will be offensive to that group of people, and other other phrases will just be um, anachronistic in that they're they're just not used anymore. Um, one thing that you should be aware of is that we don't really use um, actor and actress, or steward and stewardess. So we would refer to people, both male and female people as actor and um, male and female stewards on a plane is now flight attendant. It's a little bit more politically correct these days. So finally, just to wrap up with um, just maybe the last yeah, 15 minutes, when it comes to actually delivering the speech, we looked at the, um, the extemporaneous delivery in the last class. We should be using this. You can't fake this um, by writing out your speech and then cutting the speech into note-sized chunks. You can't deliver a memorized speech and you can't deliver a speech read from a typed manuscript. So um, you can expect to get um, a big fat zero for some of these. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept this. We need to actually do some trying here. So uh, extemporaneous delivery is the delivery that we um, f respond to best. It's the most positive response that we get. It's the most, um, it's the most uh, accessible way of speaking, I guess, is the word I'm struggling for. When we speak, we need to be aware of the volume, the pitch, the rate, the pauses, vocal variety, pronunciation, and articulation. You need to know that people should be able to hear you at the back of the class when you, you don't need to yell at people. You don't need to scream your speech at people. You need to increase the volume of your ordinary voice to make sure that people at the back of the room can actually um, hear what you're saying. When you're using a microphone, you, first of all, be aware that you don't need to shout into the microphone. Um, you will do some actual damage to the equipment with that. And the second thing is that not all microphones will amplify. Um, a recording microphone will not amplify 
and you'll still need to project your voice to the back of the room. They tell people this in law courts, and they have microphones to record people now, but the microphones don't amplify. So when the witness is giving evidence, they still need to speak up. They can't speak quietly into the microphone. Um, they actually have to have um, people um, people raise their voice and speak so everybody in the room can hear them. The, uh, the microphone does not necessarily um, increase the volume of your uh, voice. Um, especially when I'm using my headphones, like I am now. Please don't shout into the microphone. You may damage my expensive headphones and you will damage my even more expensive ears. Um, my ears are not in the best shape to begin with. I would appreciate um, not becoming prematurely deaf by uh, people shouting and screaming into my microphone. The pitch of your voice is how high or low your voice is, and the changes in the pitch are called inflections. So normally when you're telling a story, you'll find this when um, uh, parents are telling a story to their uh, to their children that they actually change the pitch of their voice to play different characters. For example, you can sound angry in a low, deep voice and sound happy like a small child, or you can sound frightened with a high voice or a high pitch can have um, different, uh, that inflection can have different meanings for the listener. Obviously, you need to have the right facial expression to go with this, having a frightened expression with a happy, uh, Happy like a friend, you know, it would, the, uh, you have to match those two things together, but be aware that you can use pitch in order to, for example, play different characters in the speech. The only thing that I really have to say with the rate of speech is please don't talk too fast. Um, this is a classic mistake that uh, people will make. Um, some students will get on stage, blast through their speech as fast as possible, run off stage and then fail the exam just because I can't understand what you're saying. So speaking too slowly will really put people to sleep. And it's often just as bad as speaking too fast. So uh, we speak between uh, 120 and 140 words a minute. That's a good rate of speech. Um, best thing to do is to record yourself and then listen to yourself the next morning. If you can't understand what you say, you are speaking too fast. Pauses can be highly effective in speeches, and if you look at the uh, Martin Luther King, if you read the transcript of I Have a Dream and listen to the speech going, going with it, uh, you'll see how he uses pauses all the time. Um, it, it's almost like he's kind of, um, th there were so many people and he was waiting for his voice to be transmitted, you know, through the, through the speaker system. There was, there was that kind of um, technical thing that he had to um, uh, deal with, but he, he put pauses. So I've got an example here from a TED talk, which was talking all about um, people who uh, were in my class uh, last semester may recognize this. Um, this was from um, a TED talk called um, Life Lessons from an Ad Man, which was um, trying to get across the idea that you don't need to force people to do things. You can think laterally and compel people to do things. So uh, the sentence was, Ataturk was very keen on abolishing the wearing of the veil in Turkey, but he didn't ban them. Instead, because he was a lateral thinker, he made it compulsory for prostitutes to wear the veil. And at the end of this sentence, there was a big pause as he was waiting for people to actually understand the consequences um, that um, no woman on the planet wants to wear the same clothes that prostitutes have to wear. No woman wants to wear the uniform of a prostitute, basically. So this was the, this was a, a really good example of this. It allowed people to think about it and it allowed people to laugh at the idea. We need to make sure that we put pauses in the, uh, at the end of the thought groups. So when we have a sentence and we have distinct thoughts, we will have, um, a pause. If you put a pause in the middle, I know I know that I break this rule all the time because I'm I'm trying to think of, of the best way of uh, expressing myself. But Ataturk was very keen on abolishing the wearing of the veil in Turkey 
But he didn't ban them instead because he was a lateral thinker. He made it compulsory for prostitutes to, it's difficult for me to do this, wear the veil. So if you put these pauses in the wrong places in the middle of the ideas that are being expressed in the clauses, it sounds very weird. If you listen to Martin Luther King, you will be able to hear these pauses more clearly and see how they're effective. Atatürk was very keen on abolishing the wearing of the veil in Turkey, but he didn't ban them. Instead, because he was a lateral thinker, he made it compulsory for prostitutes to wear the veil. So you, you pause at the dramatic points and you also pause at the... Uh, you also pause at the key points. So go back and uh, if you haven't already done so, listen to the way that um, they use pauses in uh, I Have a Dream and uh, notice. He's doing it for a slightly technical reason because it was in the 1960s and the, uh, the microphone wasn't very good. But go back and listen to those pauses. It does it very, very well. Vocal variety is uh, what we often see referred to as the music of English. And it's something really that you have to master in order to sound natural, um, in order to actually highlight the relative clauses and the beginning of the ends of questions and the beginnings and the ends of sentences and ideas. Um, you need to use variation in your voice. So a very simple example of this is to ask questions. If you ask a question that begins with is or are, then the intonation goes up. So are you a student? It goes up. If you ask an open question like what's your name, then the intonation goes down. So we need to have this, um, uh, this variation. We don't deliver the uh, speech robotically. We try to get a more conversational tone and we try to get our enthusiasm across to the audience. Pronunciation is possibly more important than people think. Pronunciation allows people to uh, cover up lapses in the grammar. So oftentimes, often, if you make a small mistake in your grammar, people will forgive that because they're actually able to understand your pronunciation more clearly. Word stress is a very, very important part of this. So we need to focus on tonic stress of certain words that change their meaning when the stress is on the different parts of the world. So present is different to present. Conflict is different to conflict. Contrast is different to contrast. Perfect is different to perfect. And produce is different to produce. Sorry, Pro yeah, produce is different to produce, Pro produce and produce. So you need to be careful. It's difficult for me to do it slowly like that. So uh, you need to be especially careful about this um, with words you've only just seen as you begin to read your research. As you be, you know, you see the words, but you don't get pronunciation guidance. Articulation is not the same as pronunciation. Pronunciation is getting the stress right in the words, where articulation is making sure that you pronounce each element of the word as it is supposed to be said. Um, one of the key things here is that native speakers, um, our ears, and you'll find this in French as well, our ears are tuned to listen to the end of words. Uh, and we're especially uh, sensitive to words like the difference between D and T, the D sound and the T sound, as well as the, I think there are three D sounds and there are three S sounds. I'll show you those in, in, a, in a minute. So 30 versus 13, you need to make sure that you're clearly articulating the third T and 13. Um, the classic mistake that we get for a lot of a lot of um, 
this um, this e y sound at the end is particularly this e sound. So it's uh, we get a lot of people saying technology rather than technology. There's a there's that articulation that needs to be there at the end of the uh, at the end of the word. You really need to hit that. Uh, that's something that doesn't get taught very often, but you need to hit the end of that word. Technology is not technology. So when you say technology, it sounds like this. That's the way that people will mispronounce technology. So we need technology. So we need to make sure that we're actually saying technology. That G sound at the end, that rolling G sound is very, very um, clear. It needs to be clear. So any words like that, and the, there are a lot of them. 30 versus 13, day versus date. We need to hit that T sound, that date sound. Now, there's lots of grammatical information at the end of verbs. That's where all the verbs change. I-N-G, ing, and ed. Um, be careful that you're saying running and not running. And that's a, a more informal way of, of, of talking about things. When we have... Um, When we have even even something simple like ed on the end of words, it's not always the same ed. So we have d, t, and id. So called is a d sound. Discovered, enjoyed, lived, saved, traveled, studied. Um, a t sound at the end. Asked, jumped, looked, missed reached, worked, and promised. So there's a t, t, t. And then at the end, there's a softer d, 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 called. We need to really get these, these end of, uh, end of uh, final syllables clear. And then finally, invited, needed, rented, avoided, counted. We always have an id sound. So called, asked, invited lived, looked, rented. So we have to have these. Um, sometimes there might be an extra syllable that you need to say. Um, the S sound, uh, just again, it goes on the end of these, um, these words. Um, talks, out, cliffs, photographs, does, frogs, songs, Curtains, so there's a definite z sound with those. Loses, kisses, buzzes, garages, pages. So there's a definite, there's a definite um, difference in, first of all, the, the D sound at the end of words and the S sounds uh, at the end of words. Those are the two big ones. Uh, there is another one as well, um, which is the... Um, which is the LE sound. So the LE, so for example, in temple, um, syllable, we don't say, we don't say temple or syllable. We actually just say the UL sound at the end and we, we try and say temple, syllable, table. We don't say table or syllable. So be careful with these, especially the ends of sentences. Oh, sorry, the ends of words, um, we need to be careful that we're hitting the right uh, sound at the end. All right then, ladies and gentlemen, so we have the uh, introductory speeches next class, let me see. So yes, the 27th and the 29th is the... Uh, So the twenty seventh, oh sorry, the twenty seventh and the thirtieth uh, presentations of the introductory speech. So we'll have um, we won't have actually any um, learning <laughs> on that uh, if, if you have indeed learnt anything. Um, we don't have any um, actual class in class, um, you know, textbook based stuff. It's just all about the uh, all about the inform. Uh, sorry, all about the introductory speeches next class. So 
hopefully there will be no more COVID disruption for that. And uh, thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.